In this video, instead of covering a monster that you could encounter at level 15 to 20, or a monster that not a lot of people have heard of, we're covering a monster today that I can almost guarantee every adventuring party has encountered in their early days. Today we're covering the dog and human looking humanoids that are fueled by a never ending hunger and dark omens, the gnolls. Hello and welcome to Dungeon Deep Dive where we talk about all things D&D from monsters and their lore to news updates and tips and advice for anyone interested in Dungeon and Dragons and want to give it a try. In today's video we're talking about these chaotic evil humanoid human hyena hybrids that are just a wave of teeth and claws washing over any village unlucky enough to grab their attention. The Knoll's first appearance into D&D was all the way back in the 1974 Dungeon and Dragons Volume 2 monsters and treasure. Even though in the latest versions of D&D their class is looking like a mix of a human slash a hyena hybrid, in monsters and treasures they are actually described as a mix of gnomes and trolls. How that would even work with a gnome and a troll, I, I, my brain can't comprehend that. Standing at a height of seven to seven and a half feet tall, these lanky towers of hunched muscle are a non-stop wall of feral hunger and primal instinct, but still have enough brain power to pull off tactical war and raid strategies. Gnolls are primarily nocturnal creatures that hunt at night in packs and are purely carnivorous, and with their gift of never-ending bloodlust and hunger from their deity Yenagu, when feasting they leave nothing behind, not even the bones, and when there is nothing to feast upon or attack, they resort to infighting within their own clans. Most gnolls originated from a time long ago when their god Yenogu found his way from the abyss into the material plane and started to reign at terror and destruction wherever he went and devoured any village he came across. While Yenogu charged through the material plane destroying everything in his path, hyenas would follow him scavenging off the leftovers he would leave behind until they would literally grow too fat to move. That is a literal quotation from the books that the hyenas would grow too fat and they would just lay there because they can't move. Some of the hyenas that would grow fat and can't move would then transform with the consumption of the abyssal energy left in the meat they ate into the gnolls we see today. While most people believe Yonago created the gnolls, this actually isn't true. The first known gnoll deity is Goralik, a chaotic evil demigod from the realm of pandemonium in the abyss. Slowly declining in power and slowly becoming more savage and feral, he was at constant ends with his rival Yenogu. In his weakened state, Yenogu defeated Goralik and is said that he consumed Goralik in his entirety. That then is rumored to be giving Yenogu his ability to create the gnolls. Gnolls rarely have any interest in clerical rituals and instead use their brutality as a sign of devotion to Yenogu. And painting the eye of Yenogu on their weapons and armor, and howling in his name at times of war and battle. Blood offerings and prisoner sacrifices would also take place in worship to Yonogu after great victories. And at times, certain gnolls would be granted the chance to become possessed by a demonic spirit, making them one of his chosen disciples known as the Fangs of Yonogu. Gnolls at their oldest tend to live into their 40s, but most end up dying in their early to late 20s due to battle or savage clan infighting. If, if a gnoll manages to reach old age, they don't really show any signs of aging in how adulthood until the very end of their life where they rapidly decline in health and die. As a DM myself, I feel like gnolls are a great monster always to have in your back pocket purely because they can be found in literally every climate you can think of. So they're always great to throw at your players just like fill timing. Or if you need like a, a monster that say if your players are raiding a dungeon or an underground cavern and you need a monster to fill the gap to like wear down their abilities maybe. Throw a couple of gnolls in there. Throw a gnoll village in there that's been scouring the underdark. Maybe it's a underdark converted gnoll that only sees with sound because they've been in the dark so long that they've gone blind. Not really being the conversational types and being of more a primal beast, gnolls live for the thrill of the hunt and tend to favor the wilderness for their homes rather than the settlements in the same vein as other humanoids like humans, dwarves, and elves. Although it is known for gnolls to take up root in certain cities, and live their lives in civilization. Even open shops, I mean, quite a living doing so. You may get a knoll that is into tanning and stretching leather and making armor. You may get some knolls that are blacksmiths. You may even get a knoll that is a practitioner in the arcane and owns a magic shop. Gnolls that give into their bestial nature live in their nomadic packs and despite their savagery and brutal nature, 
place a very strong value when it comes to family, especially bloodline ties above almost everything else. So much so that even if two packs happen to be fighting side by side, a pack would not even think of throwing away personal glory for themselves to help the other pack. If a singular Noel happens to get separated from its pack and has no way of getting back to them, their instincts and urge to have a family and a pack leads them to create a surrogate pack with those that it would class as friends. I'm going to say friends in quotations here because I can always guarantee if a null managed to get back to their original pack, they will abandon you in a second. Some packs or tribes, as they're also known as, are also known to taking other fanatics of other races to become null cultists that adapt to the lifestyle of the nulls and are given the blessing of hunger and bloodlust. This affliction would mutate the cultists, taking up characteristics of the nulls. That being maybe they get long razor-like claws and patches of fur growing on their skin or maybe they even get sharp fangs in the mouth. Going back to the Knoll creating the surrogate pack, I feel like this is a great trope and a classic backstory hook for, for bringing in a Knoll as a playable character. Knoll settlements rarely have any metal workers or leather workers and their weapons are mainly made from scavenging other settlements and picking up the scraps from what they find. They have been known to take in prisoners as slaves for hard labour, cleaning and any repairs they need and for food. But 9 times out of 10 the slaves will become the food themselves. So, That being the case, some Knolls elevate to the rank of Tantakurash or spirit breakers. These are ranked slightly higher than the regular gnolls and their main job is to break the will of their slaves through non-stop torture and bend them to utter loyalty and still they'll eventually become food. Some slaves will become so brutalized and broken that they would actually take up the savage nature of their captors and become Krishantels or savage souls. This would actually elevate their rank in the pack to that of the same level of hyenas that are essentially the pets of the gnolls. Savage souls are essentially gnolls in every sense of the word, except for looks with a handful still retaining some of their intellect. This would make the savage souls great for infiltrating and sabotaging villages and towns that the gnolls want to raid, feeding them details and finding the best vantage points to raid. The majority of clans that follow Yanogu tend to interbreed with demons from the abyss. This then produced half-breeds who then mainly became leaders of gnoll tribes and then their offspring are then to become their lieutenants and priests to supply them with non-stop healing magic. You kind of get the vibe that these half-breeds are very selfish creatures. There are multiple variants to the gnolls that include the standard gnoll, the flesh gnaw, the hunter, the pack lord, the witherling, the flind and the fang of Yunogu. And even, this were a surprise to me, there are gnoll vampires. Starting with the standard Knoll sitting at 15 hit points, there's nothing really special about the standard Knoll except for its rampage ability, where when the Knoll reduces a creature to 0 hit points with a melee attack on its turn, the Knoll can take a bonus action to move up to half its speed and make a bite attack. This is good if you want to pack a Knoll to like quickly clear out a village while the adventurers are just getting there because if they clear one of the villages out, they can quickly run to another one. Next, we have the Flesh Gnor. Nora. The Flesh Nora is slightly stronger than the standard Knoll and a little more agile in its movement. These guys are a little bit more slender in their build. Again, there's nothing too special except for it has a multi-attack instead of a single attack as well as the Rampage ability. It does also have a Sudden Rush ability where until the end of its turn, the Knoll's speed increases by 60 feet and it doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. So these guys pretty fast. Flins are similar in appearance to gnolls except a little bit shorter and more broader in stature, making them a lot more stronger and dangerous than their brothers. Sitting at a challenge rating of 9 and 127 hit points, these guys are quite the jump from a regular gnoll. They have a trait called Aura of Bloodthirst, where if a flind isn't incapacitated, any creature with a rampage trait can make a bite attack as a bonus action while within 10 feet of the flind. For their actions, they have a multi-attack action where it can make three attacks, one with each of its flails or three with its longbow. And its flails also have their own individual abilities. First, we have the Flail of Pain that deals 1d10 plus 5 bludgeoning damage and 4d10 psychic damage. The other we have the Flail of Paralysis that deals 1d10 plus 5 bludgeoning and the target must succeed on a DC 16 constitution saving throw or be paralyzed until the end of its turn. This is essentially the stun, the monk stun. 
for the flint. And the final one, we have the Flail of Madness. That again deals 1d10 plus 5 bludgeoning damage. And the target must make a DC 16 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the target must make a melee attack against a random target within its reach. And on its next turn, if it has no target within reach, even after moving, it loses its action on that turn. These guys are no joke. Next up, we have the undead variant called the Witherling. Sitting at a measly 11 hit points, these guys are more just running as the pack and do as much damage as possible. They have a reaction called Vengeful Strike, where in response to a null being reduced to zero hit points within 30 feet of the Witherling, the Witherling can make a free melee attack. It's funny how the Witherlings are made as well. When a null dies, sometimes of starvation, mainly of battle, if the body is taken back, the bones will be kept and then they can get like their priests or their um, blood clerics of the pack to raise them as Witherlings to bolster their ranks. So literally no one goes to waste. Nothing goes to waste with the Nulls. In charge of all these guys that we've mentioned so far, we have the Pack Lord. Even though these guys are only a challenge rating of two, they are a good support for a pack of Nulls. They have an ability called Insight Rampage, where one creature the Null can see within 30 feet of it can use its reaction to make a melee attack if it can hear the Null and has the Rampage trait. I feel like in a battle scenario, you'll see like the Pack Lord sitting at the back while all the regular Nulls are out of the front. Regular Null, regular Null. <laughs> just in the range of the pack load just so it can use its inside rampage ability coming up next we have the great fangs of yinagu these guys are sitting at 65 hit points and have a challenge rating of four and these guys have a multi-attack and the rampage ability as well honestly looking at the stat block of these guys are expecting a lot more are expecting these guys to have a little bit more oomph becoming the chosen of their god and becoming possessed by a demonic spirit. Maybe something like they get to add psychic damage to their attacks or in a, maybe like an ability that can summon two spectral hyenas once a day to fight at their side. I don't know, just something to add a little flavor because I feel like the stats of these guys are very plain. Let me know what you guys think down below. And last but certainly not least, we have the variant that I only knew of since researching Knolls, the Knoll Vampire. Sitting at a challenge rating of A and 93 hit points, seems to be like the strongest out of the gnolls hp wise second to the flind but challenge rating pretty high it has a bunch of abilities at its disposal like the shape changer ability where if the creature isn't in sunlight it can use an action to polymorph into a large hyena or a medium cloud of mist while in hyena form the vampire can't speak and its walking speed is 50 feet its statistics other than its size and speed are unchanged Anything it is wearing transforms with it, but nothing it is carrying does. It reverts to its true form if it dies. It also has advantage on perception checks with its keen smell ability, as well as the standard rampage ability and regeneration, where it regains 10 hit points at the start of its turn if it has at least one hit point left and isn't in sunlight or running water. You know, standard vampire stuff. If the vampire takes radiant damage or damage from holy water, this trait doesn't function at the start of the vampire's turn. It has a multi-attack with its bite and claws, with its bite dealing 2d6 plus 5 piercing damage and 2d8 necrotic damage. Also, the target's hit point maximum is reduced by the amount equal to the necrotic damage taken. And the vampire regains hit points equal to that amount. So I feel like you can stack the HP regain with that ability with the regeneration that it gets at the start of its turn get back a pretty decent amount of hit points the reduction lasts until the target finishes a long rest and the target dies if its hit point maximum is reduced to zero its frightful cackle emits a bone chilling cackle each creature of the vampire's choice that is in within 120 feet of the vampire can hear its cackle and must succeed on a dc 15 wisdom saving throw or become frightened for one minute. A creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. If the creature's saving throw is successful, the effect on the creature ends, and it is immune to the vampire's frightening cackle for the next 24 hours. And lastly, it has the sickening gaze ability, where the vampire targets one humanoid, it can see within 30 feet of it. If the target can see the vampire, they must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw against the magic, or be poisoned for 24 hours. And obviously, if you succeed on the save, you are not poisoned and you are immune for 24 hours all in all i'm really impressed with the history and lore on the gnolls i've always known of them but never fully looked into them and i'm actually impressed and can see some real potential with them you can have a classic band of gnolls attacking a village that live in the mountains close by 
by taking food and prisoners to sacrifice. Or even if your party are just starting out at low level, they can come across a group of savage souls on patrol, only to find that they had a small camp close by that is actually a null camp filled with prisoners of the town close by. Or if you want to think a little bit bigger, you can have a vampire lord that has a pack of vampire gnolls as pets that protect its lair and bring it people to feast upon. I am definitely going to be adding some of these guys to my campaign that I'm running. 100%. But all in all, that is going to be it for our video today on the Knolls. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate it. I hope you found this video helpful. And if there's anything else about the Knolls that I've missed, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Thank you to Wurev. I, I apologize if I'm brutally <laughs> brutalizing your name. I apologize, dude. For putting the idea of doing some monsters more common in the D&D games. I appreciate it, bud. I'll leave a link to all the websites I've used for my research on the topic so you guys can read through it yourself. What monster do you think I should do next? If you have any suggestions, please do leave it down below in the comments. I would love to see it. You can also find the links to all my social medias in the description down below. Thank you all for watching again, and I'll see you all in the next video.